Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Impact, written by Hicks Ken. It was early morning as Plo walked through the forest. This planet's binary star system was asymmetrical, so he was being treated to a spectacular show of shifting light patterns as the larger star rose up behind the smaller one. He pulled his data pad from his phone and checked the day's task list. He made a few quick notes about the ambient temperatures and atmospheric conditions and marked the first few items complete. He glanced down towards the primary goal after the normal housekeeping procedures. Anomalous gravity gradient mapping subtropical forest zone 6 sector 87-D. He took a steady breath, the atmospheric processor on his face, scrubbing the incoming air for unclassified particles. The Atmoproc was standard safety equipment on all unprocessed planets, and Plo would be taking no chances on this first solo assignment in the outer belt. Gravity gradients were already a difficult task, owing to the need to occasionally recalibrate the instruments by dropping them and hoping they didn't break but add the anomalous alert plus environmental zone conditions, and this is the kind of work careers were built on. Plo tapped the datapad in acknowledgement and pulled up a navigational program to guide him to the designated zone. He walked for a few hours, occasionally pausing to take notes or holographic images of interesting features of the landscape or some unfamiliar species. His mission to this uncharted world was focused on the larger geographical questions that would need answering before the larger teams with more specialists could even approach the planet. But collecting rudimentary bits of data for the next guy was always good politics. If specialist teams knew that you could get them some preliminary data to start building research proposals around, they'd keep you employed and in demand. At one point, a clearing in the forest appeared before him. The suns were now both high overhead, their light blending together and making the nearby leaves shimmer in a riot of ultraviolets and even a little in the prismatic region. He quietly thanked the past versions of himself for thinking to get visual augmentations and the ocular data link upgrade. Seeing this was extraordinary in its own right, but being able to record it to a data cell was profitable. After a few minutes in the clearing, he glanced skyward again, movement caught his attention. A small ship, if it could even be described as such, was hurtling through the air without any pretense of stabilization. Rapid flashes erupted along the structure, followed by fragmentation of what he assumed was the fuselage. He assumed because although the design was alien to him, there were only so many shapes to use to move metal through air, and this was roughly in one of them. One of the fragments ejected at a strange angle and started trading some billowing cloth. A pilot? Both thought as he watched the scene unfold. Another fragment of the craft broke free through what could only be described as a statistically unlikely bad luck. Ripping through the billowing cloth, the pilot began falling again without anything to stop it but the ground below. Plo pulled out the project schedule on his data pad. A quick check confirmed it. Nobody was scheduled for arrival here for several rotations at least. That plus the fact that this craft didn't look anything like any he'd ever seen, even when it was in one piece, told him that it wasn't for anyone from the council race. Still, the pilot fell roughly in the area of the assigned task, and salvage rights were salvage rights. He left the clearing quickly and continued on his way. He took no additional data on the way there, but he justified it to himself by considering the possibility that the salvage may come under defensive attack by native flora or fauna and that would thus be best recovered quickly. As he neared where the pilot had likely come down, he slowed his pace and glanced at the forest around him. Several of the taller trees had been obliterated at varying heights. The closer ones had damage beginning fairly high up, but some further away seemed to have damage lower down. He raised his data pants camera and pulled up a quick hollow modeling program. A few taps later, and his pad extrapolated where the damage would likely reach the ground level. He worked his way through the trees, noting with academic surprise at the way their superstructures had been effectively pulverized by the impact. Given his recollection of their density from previous days' work, 
the object that had hit them would have had to have been impressively dense. Of course, that would make sense. An ejecting pilot in an escape pod would justify the material cost for such a dense object. Another few minutes of walking brought Plo to an impact crater that looked like something between a nest of a Galafi avid mating quarters and gladiatorial arenas of ancient Duronato, the race that thankfully moved on. A strange mass lay at the center of the crater. Plo set the data pad to follow a drone mode and released it. It lifted into the air a few feet behind him and began recording. He slid down the side of the crater and approached the mass with caution. The shape was highly unusual for an escape pod, with appendages sticking out from the main Wagman! Plo jumped backwards. Escape pods didn't make sounds, they just escaped. This wasn't a pod at all. One of the appendages shifted, lifting main mass up slightly and allowing the other appendages to move to a different position. Nope, not an escape pod. Perhaps some advanced exosuit or even power armor. In any case, salvage rights no longer applied. This thing was alive. Plo stepped forward again and spoke a greeting in galactic common. Greetings, entity of unknown origin. I observed your vessel's failure and have come to render aid. Are you injured? The object turned quickly at Plo's voice. Sound came from it. No intendo, no pabla de a. Dois moi, un momento. The object raised an appendage and tapped on another smaller and rounder appendages. That was galactic common, came a voice. I sure hope so, because this translator doesn't work for anything but Earth and GC. Plo replied, yes, galactic common, excellent. Do you require aid or are you injured in any way? The appendages moved slowly and along a strange range of motion. The voice then answered, Everything seems to be where it should be. I've got some scratches and cuts, but nothing broken. I'll take some peroxide and isopropyl if you have any, though. Plo considered the request. Explosive oxidants or toxic polar hydrocarbons. A strange request after a crash, unless... Plo gestured to the data pad, which promptly returned to its hand. The mention of Earth plus explosives and toxins and non-salvage encounter after a shipwreck. Plo looked back at the being. Any peroxide or isopropyl, Oh. Uh, uh, no, sorry. Those are not part of standard fuel kit for my people. Figures. Thanks anyway. Hey, did you happen to see which way the rest of my ship went? Plo pointed along the path of damaged trees. Thanks, pal. The being began walking and got several feet before Plo recovered from his shock. He caught up quickly. Excuse me for the thoughtness of the question and the absurdity of it, if I'm mistaken, but might you be a human from Soul 3 Terror? The being didn't stop walking as it answered, Oh, yep, that's me. Daniela Espianto is the name, yours. I am called Plo of the 47th Expeditionary Luvand Dynasty. Tell me, Daniela Esposito, where is your escape pod? Don't have one. But you ejected from your vessel and are still alive. If you're worried about a salvage rights claim, don't be. I waive all claims. Well, it's nice, but I don't even have an escape pod. I ejected when the bird went dead stick on me, and here I am. Plo considered this for a few moments as he followed along. You mean to tell me that you were not in the escape pod of any kind? What about personal energy shielding, then? Is that how you survived the impact? Personal what now? No, none of that. Plo was shocked, but there were still a few more possibilities to explain what had happened. Perhaps your exosuit is composed of a kinetic energy conversion nanites. Sir. They're embargoed, of course, due to the ongoing conflict of Olgatana. Terra, uh, but you're a human, so I suppose the embargo doesn't technically apply? No nanite whatsoever, but keep talking. The engineers back home are gonna love this. Oh, and, uh, exosuit? Blue gestured to Daniela with several limbs. Yes, the external casing that you have on. It seems to be highly flexible yet resistant to damage. I confess that I know little of exosuit design theory, so I cannot imagine what the small fibers are for, unless they are some form of sensor array. Dude, that's my leg hair. I've been flying for a week. Leave the sister alone about the grooving. Plo stopped to distract. Apologies, Daniela Espinosa. Are you saying this is all biomatter? Are your people engaging in bioengineering? I am saying that's my leg, not some exosuit thing. But the trees... Yeah, they help break my fall. Some of them poofed when I got them, though. You fell from a very high altitude with no exosuit, escape pod, or personal shield generator. You should be deceased and possibly vaporized. Nah, the cheese isn't so bad. Back home, it's about two and a half of this, sir. Uh, 
The fall is inconvenient and annoying, but, you know, they train us on reorientation during a freefall for just such an occasion, like cats. So you assert that you ejected from a flying vessel with no safety equipment whatsoever, and the extent of your injuries upon impact with the planet is minor cosmetic abrasions? Yep. Flo spent the next several minutes in silence as he considered the implications of what this meant. Daniela Espinosa, one. Daniela is fine. You don't have to say my whole name. I feel like my mother is about to hit me with a shoe. Daniela then, uh, you say your home suffers 2.5 times the gravity, as is felt here? They're about, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if we'd call it suffering it exactly. For us, it's normal. Plus, we can do stuff like this on lighter planets. Without warning, she crouched down and then rocketed upwards, easily 20 feet into the air. Flo quietly thanked his past self again for the visual data recording augment. As Daniela returned to the ground, Flo could not help but stare. Your people can fly without wings. Why do you even need the ship? Well, uh, not so much flying. Daniela bared her teeth, sending a cold rush of fear through Plo. More like falling with style. The data pad chirped and Plo glanced at it. Ah, the rest of your ship should be just over that rise here. Daniela climbed up over it quickly, and Plo followed behind, still recording. As expected, the rest of the ship was scattered along their path, stretching several hundred yards. On either side of the wreckage was a line of exploded trees. Daniela began systematically lifting, examining, and then throwing debris aside. Plo continued his questioning anew. Are you augmented with internal construction robotics? Daniela stopped and turned with a tilt of her head. Bro, what the hell are you talking about? You are lifting, manipulating, and accelerating large pieces of metal as though they were native grasses. Are you augmented in some way? Inside Plo desperately hoped it should say yes. Nope, I'm just a regular Terran. No augments, but I mean, come on. I'm running at 40% G, and I think the auction here is in the mid-30s. It's nice. Sometimes a girl likes to feel like a superhero. She tossed aside a hull panel, annihilating a nearby tree in the process. Ah, found it. She raised a small, blinking cylinder to Plo's sight. Emergency bug out beacon, good for a one-way jump back to home sweet home. You should stand back. Plo obeyed, all eyes on the surreal scene before him. Daniela flipped a switch on top of the cylinder and held a thumb at the bottom inside. There is no place like home, she winked at Plo and clicked her heels together, then pressed the button. Everything in a two-meter radius around her vanished in an instant, including her. Plo was left standing at an empty crater and felt a brief rush of wind as the air filled in the vacuum that she'd left behind. He grabbed the data pad and hastily composed a message, then attached his visual data files and sent it off. The relay satellites in orbit would get it where it needed to go. He sat on the edge of the departure crater and waited. The data pad chirped. He opened the message. All research protocols suspended. Human quarantine breached. All Galactic Council members are to report emergency locations and waits orders. Pro sighed. He'd always thought the talk of humans was an exaggeration, meant to scare the populace into accepting the need for a quarantine zone. Now, he understood. The entire galaxy would have to unite to deal with this. They would have to choose to pursue unity and peace with these monsters from a death world, or they'd have to somehow destroy them all. From what Plo had just witnessed, he desperately hoped that they would choose peace. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Bushmaster 177, Henry the Red, Casper Arnholtz, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Elijah Silvercross, Dragzoon WRE, and Severin Cerberus. Thank you very much.